We are going to read from our Bibles, but before we do so, we have a question from the caddy because uh, I'd like you to read the answer with me. You want to stand and we'll read, to, read the answer together. Question is, why is he called Christ mean anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who fully reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our deliverance. Our only high priest who has delivered us by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal King who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. That's the catechism. You can be seated. We'll read the scripture next. That's going to form the guideline for, for, for our message today. And, and you hear, heard it talk about Jesus being prophet, priest, and king. And we're going to be talking about those things. But let's turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. In the book of Hebrews, there are so many Old Testament themes, and it shows that Jesus is superior in every way. And here it talks about the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. Hebrews chapter 9, at, at verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the one of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. The way of the high priest enters the, the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was crucified once to take away the sins of many and will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that your word speaks. And thank you that you have spoken to us through Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that we can continue to hear you speak to our lives. Because we know from you there is life. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I recently had someone ask me uh, what I deemed a very good question. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I preached a message, and when I preached that message, two of the points were that Christianity is both inclusive and Christianity is exclusive. Somebody said to me after the service, you know that you preached that sermon uh, six years ago. And um, I, I don't know if I was supposed to be embarrassed, but I was thrilled. I was thrilled. Do you remember that? You remembered six years ago I preached that same thing? Well, good. I'm glad. I'm happy about that. But in that message, two of the four points were that Christianity is, in a sense, inclusive. It's inclusive because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter if you are Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter. All those human distinctions don't matter. If you call on the Lord, if you turn to God through Jesus, you will be saved. It's a promise of God. But it is exclusive because it says in a sense that we need to come to God through Jesus. It doesn't say that we can come to God any way we choose. It doesn't say that all roads lead to heaven. It doesn't say that all roads lead to God. But instead we say that we come to God through Jesus. Now, the question that someone asked me was, was this. Do the other religions, do the other religions teach things that are exclusive? 
Now, you have to be careful here because there are so many other religions in the world. But if you're talking about the major religions of the world, the answer is yes, absolutely. They are exclusive in their teachings as well. They teach that there is a way to God and a way not to God. So who are the people who say, who are the people who say that really all religions are alike? Doesn't matter what you believe. All, all religions lead to God. Well, the people who say that are mostly people who aren't committed to any religion. To put it real simply, they're secular people that aren't committed and don't believe a certain faith. And they say any old faith will do. In other words, there are a whole lot of people in Europe and in America that say it doesn't matter what you believe, all religions are alike, but that's pretty much the society of the uncommitted who make that statement. And so it does matter who you believe in and what you believe. Now this morning I don't want to go in depth into other religions, but I do want to touch on it a couple times in the message. And we'll do that, and we'll ask three different questions. And the first question is this one. Who speaks for God? Who speaks for God? Now, if you take a look at Judaism, Judaism would say, well, Moses certainly spoke for God. Moses was the prophet of God. But modern-day Judaism doesn't just look at what Moses wrote, you know, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, but, but modern Judaism is what you call rabbinical Judaism. It's based on, on what Moses wrote, but then all the, not all, but the best teachings of the rabbis over the years. That's rabbinical Judaism. And what it teaches basically is, is the law of Moses and a whole lot more laws added to it. That's kind of Judaism, what that does, it's like. It's a religion of this is how to live according to these rules. God spoke through Moses, and he speaks through these others. If you talk about Islam, of course, Islam's a massively followed religion today. There's over a billion Muslim people in this world. They are extremely exclusive in what they believe. Muslims believe that there are five things that you need to do. Maybe you've heard of the five pillars of Islam. Five things that you need to be doing. But the main thing in the Islamic faith is they say that there is one God, Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger. Okay? Islam is very exclusive in that matter. It doesn't say that there are a lot of gods. It doesn't say that there's the Christian God or even the Jewish God. It says there is one God and his name is Allah and there is one messenger named Muhammad. Now, uh, that is what they say. What's interesting is there are a lot, of, a lot of Muslim people who do believe sort of in Jesus. Now, they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but the interesting thing is there are a number of Muslims who believe that Jesus was a very, very good man. In fact, there are some Muslims who believe that Jesus was such a good man, he was zipped up to heaven and he never died. They believe that about Jesus. But at the same time, Muslims believe that a better prophet has come and his name is Muhammad. It's not nearly as important that you listen to Jesus. You must listen to Muhammad because he is the messenger from God. Now, to me, the strange thing about that is if you examine even the least, the life of Jesus, and you examine just the least, the life of Muhammad, Muhammad doesn't begin to compare the way he lived as to the way Jesus lived. Strange, strange. There are these different religions. They do teach things that are exclusive. And so do we. We teach things that are exclusive. We teach faith in Jesus Christ. So, who speaks for God? Well, Jesus speaks for God. Jesus speaks for God because he is God. 
you go back to the beginning of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is the, the chief prophet, our chief prophet. He is the one and only. He is the one who speaks for God. Remember when he came down from the, the mountain of transfiguration, God said, this is my son. Listen to him. If you want to hear the voice of God, you listen to Jesus. Now this morning, you know, I don't fear that there are many people who are going to leave here and say, well, I'm considering um, turning to Judaism. And I don't think that there are many people here who say, well, I, I think I'll give um, Islam a shot. I don't have that fear this morning. I did talk about them a little bit, but just to inform you a little bit of what they believe. But it's not because I fear that, oh, people here are going to turn to those different places. But there are plenty of voices today that claim to speak for God. You know, back in the day, people used to ask me, what do you think of this TV preacher? What do you think of that TV preacher? And now, nowadays, you can go online and you, and you can hear all kinds of people speaking for God. Any church you can imagine, but some, some people who deem themselves to be prophets and apostles and everything else, they speak for God. You can find just about anything you want, if you look for it online, of people who claim to speak for God. But there are others. Now, now they're not going to come out and say, well, we speak for God. But what they do say is we speak the truth. We speak the truth. And if you're saying that we speak the truth, well, then I think you are in a sense saying, well, we speak for God. Now, some of it's for a specific area. Maybe they'll say, well, we speak the truth when it comes to our financial matters. So listen to what we say about financial matters. That's true. Some, some, some speak the truth. They speak their wisdom for, for specific things. But if you think about it, many people claim to be ones who speak the truth for life. Listen to what we're saying. This is how you're supposed to live. There are life coaches, business gurus, political pundits, news commentators, social media experts, and there are influencers. Yeah, influencers who say, this is the way you're supposed to live. Listen to me. Now I know they don't say, I speak for God, but they do say, this is the right way, this is the good way, this is the way of truth, live this way. And there are a plethora of voices today calling us to listen to them. Now, how do you discern? How do you discern if what they say is, is right or not, if it's true or not, if it's good or not? How do you discern? And of course, the most important thing is how do they line up with Jesus? Do the words that they speak, do they line up with Jesus? Do they get us more in harmony with Jesus or are they leading us away from Jesus? What is it? Where are they leading us to? How are they calling us to live? What's the shape of our life? Will it look more like the life of Jesus or less like the life of Jesus if we listen to them? You know, Jesus told us, you know, be, be, before you go to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye, take the plank out of your own eye. And that goes with behavior quite often, Right? You know, I, I think i got to correct my neighbor because of something he's doing. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, if I take a look at my life, um, if I'm honest, well, maybe I'm doing something worse than them. But I can see it's faults quickly. But I wonder if we need to do that with our, our thinking as well and with our, 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 our faith. I can see someone else's error a mile away. I can, I can see someone else's incorrect theology from a distance. But maybe when it comes to, to my words and my thinking, I have to reevaluate that and be sure that it's lining up with Jesus. Who speaks for God? 
Jesus speaks for God. Listen for his voice. Listen for him. Use discernment. There are so many voices. Listen for the voice of Jesus. Okay, that's the first question. Who speaks for God? What's the second question? Who can connect us to God? If I talk for a minute about other faiths, in Judaism, that's kind of a moot point. Judaism is it's basically today a, um, a law-keeping religion. This is what you must do. You must do these things. This is how you are to live in the here and now. It's to guide your life. It's to shape your life. Live this way. But the truth of the matter is there are many, many Jews or people of the Jewish faith today who don't think anything about having a relationship with God and they don't talk much about eternity at all. What they talk about is your life here and now and this is the way you should live. This should be the shape of your life. So it's kind of a moot question. It seems strange, but their faith says very little about connecting you to God in some personal way that you can have a relationship with God. Don't say that. Now, what's Islam say? <laughs> I told you there are five pillars of Islam, and, and, and you've got to do these five things. And what they basically say is you really have to live well. That's their point. You really have to live well. You have to try your hardest to do good. And sometimes their definition of good is a little bit different than ours. But they say you've got to live this outstanding life. And then you hope. You hope that Allah will show you mercy. But you don't know. You don't know. So who connects you to God? It's a big question mark. Whether we really can get connected to God at all. Now Hinduism is an interesting thing. Basically people describe Hinduism with the word karma. In other words, they say it's cause and effect. Or in other words, you reap according to what you have sown. Okay? And so what they say is if you do good in the next life, you will receive good. If you do bad, you will receive bad. You get what you deserve. That's kind of the teaching of Hinduism, but they don't really believe in a personal God and stuff either. But... Uh, You'll get what you deserve. Now, this is going to sound a little bit strange, but isn't that the same way that a whole lot of people think today? If you ask, who connects us to God? Um, or if you put it this way, if, if, if you died and you stood before God and said, and God said, you know, why should I let you into my kingdom? Why should I allow you into heaven? Most people would kind of give the Hindu answer. Well, I lived a pretty good life. I, I, I'm a pretty good person. I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, the good in my life outweighs the bad. And so I should be accepted into your kingdom. That's kind of the American, European way of thinking. If you've done okay, well, why in the world wouldn't God accept you? because we're pretty good people. Now the standard is pretty low. What's it mean to live a good life? Well, basically don't hurt anyone else and be true to yourself. And that's the way to live. Christianity is way out of step with that kind of thinking. Because Christianity says we have a problem does. It's on a step with contemporary thinking because people think we're pretty good people. But Christianity says, really? We have a problem. And we need help. Well, it's more than we need help. We need rescue. It's not like there's a game of tug of war coming on and, and uh, um, Hey, Pete, come over here and help because we, we, we can't win this. You give us just a little extra. It's not a tug of war and we need a little help. It's more like this. We're trapped and we can't get out. We need rescue. 
that's what Christianity teaches. We do have a problem that we cannot fix ourselves. And what we need is we need someone to stand in the gap. Now, it is true that in the history of religions, there are a lot of religions that ha have their priests. They recognize that you've got to have someone stand in the middle. You've got to have someone in the gap. Historically, that's true that a lot of people have believed that, that how can we stand before a perfect God? They've had their priests. But we have a priest that is so incredibly different. He came not only to make a sacrifice, but he came and he was the sacrifice. And that's the passage that we read. He, he, he is the once and for all sacrifice. That is the effective sacrifice because he covers all of our sin. This sacrifice works. And we can come to God through him because of the sacrifice he made. And secondly, because this one is still high priest and he is praying for you. How does the Bible put it? Uh, Romans chapter 8. And he is always living to intercede for us. Jesus is praying for you. We really don't think of that often. Jesus is this incredible high priest, the only high priest. He is the one that died on the cross to pay the price, but he is the one who continues to pray for us. Now, there are a lot of people who say, well, who needs that? Come on, we're pretty good people. Why, Why would we need that if God is a good God? But I also think there are plenty of people who think, will start to wonder, you know, are honest with themselves and say, well, I'm, I'm really not as good as I like to pretend I am. And sometimes those doubts, I'm sure, haunt them. I'm good enough just the way I am. I agree, it's... it's um, we have every right to be uneasy if we're going to do this on our own, if I'm going to go at it alone. And for people who just say, well, if you're pretty good, really? Do you mean that? I'm sure the, uh, the, the, the doubts come. But, but we have that fabulous gift of God. But, but we have this one who stands in the gap. The one and only. So who can connect us to God? Jesus can. So who speaks for God? Christ does. Who can connect us with God? Jesus does. And who rules? You can look at that in two different ways. Number one, we can take a look at the world and see all the things that are going on. And you think of the book of Revelation, the cry goes out, how long, O oh Lord? How long is this going to continue? And sometimes people say, who rules? And the wrong seems off so strong. You know what I mean? But we still say, today, Christ rules. He is the ruler yet. Yeah, there still is a division of powers. There, there's a battle that still goes on. But I guarantee you, Jesus rules. And someday he returns. And when he returns, his kingdom will come in its fullness. We can look at things right now and say, yeah, we don't understand everything, but we know our God reigns. And we can look at things right now and say, and he calls us to follow him. He is the great king. So follow him. Love him. Obey him. Walk with him. Because he is the king who is going to reign forever and ever. And we, yes, we too shall reign with him. So in a sense, we can say everything, everything that we're talking about this morning just points us back to Jesus. 
He's the one. Do you know him? He's the one. Do you trust him? He's the one. Do you follow him? He's the one. He's the one. Let's pray together.